Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are faithful forever. That right there gives us reason to rejoice. Lord, even as your children, there are days we just really struggle to find the good, to find the things that bring peace to our lives. Lord, walk with us in the midst of our journey of life and faith to realize that you are the Lord who reigns forever and who makes a difference in our lives each day. We thank you for that blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers, sisters in Christ, Paul's letter to the Philippians, the people in the church in the ancient city of Philippi, has often been called his epistle or letter of joy. In just four chapters, Paul uses the word joy or rejoice 16 times. And joy, by its very definition, is that emotion or feeling that comes with success or good fortune. So, maybe you think that uh, Paul was on a vacation somewhere, lounging out on the beach, soaking up some rays. Or maybe he just entered into retirement, and life is good. Or maybe, just possibly, he won the Holy Land Lottery. No, that's not the case. He's sitting in a dungeon cell. There's no telling how long he's going to be there before he even comes to trial. And when he does, it's very likely he'll be condemned to death without much of a trial. But really, this is absolutely nothing new for this man. Ever since God had called him into the ministry, among the other things you see up here, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been beaten up, left for dead, bitten by poisonous snakes. This guy didn't have an easy life. So either he is completely delusional, or Paul has something I really want. If he can find reason to rejoice and find joy in the midst of all this stuff, that, I'd really like to find out what that's all about. And that's exactly what we're going to do this summer. For the next six weeks after this, we're going to dig into his letter and look at all the reasons that Paul finds joy and reasons to rejoice, even in trying times. This week, we discover that Paul finds reasons to rejoice because he's confident that God has plans for his future. There is a reason and a purpose that he is alive at this time and that place. He is so convinced of his future that it gives him reason to have joy. I don't know about you, I could use even more joy in my life. As I look around, especially the last, what's it been, 16 months, things around us that are happening there are days it's a struggle to find much to have joy about. But God has this way of working behind the scenes in our lives to bring joy in ways maybe we never expected. How does he do that? We rejoice because God has a future plan for us. Just like Paul rejoiced in his future. Being convinced of that brought great joy to him just like it does for you and me today, because the thing that can zap the joy out of our lives is the unknown about what might be waiting. What will tomorrow, next year, next week, next month bring us? We can't always answer that. And while we're waiting to find out about what's going to happen, we can worry, we can lose sleep, we have doubts. There's just not a lot of room to rejoice. Will the mortgage be approved? Will you get that promotion you've been waiting for so long? Or lately, will you even keep your job? Will you make the cut for grad school? Or are you going to have to start the application process all over again? Isn't waiting for test results often much more challenging than when you actually receive them? It's the unknown that can literally strip the joy out of our lives. Now, wouldn't it change everything 
if we knew the future, now I'll admit that could be a double-edged sword, but you could slog through some really rough, difficult stretches if you knew that eventually, hey, the promotion will happen. Yes, your test results will come back negative. Everything's going to be fine. If you knew how the story was going to end, in many cases there'd be a lot less stress in your life. Instead, there'd be room for joy to replace that. And that's exactly what Paul is saying to the people and the church in that ancient city of Philippi. When you are convinced of your future and you know how things are going to work out, that makes all the difference in the world. In fact, it led Paul to write, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In other words, either way, I win, whether I live or die. But if I'm to go on living in this body, that will mean fruitful labor for me. But which do I choose? You see, Paul wins whether he lives or dies in that prison cell. If he lives, Jesus is with him, and he gets to share what his passion is. He gets to tell others about Jesus and help bring up that tiny church he started in Philippi through his letters. But if he dies, he spends an eternity with Jesus. He wins either way. I can almost imagine Paul sitting in that dark, damp dungeon cell as the jailer says to him, now Paul, you know this is never going to go to trial. But if it does, they're going to condemn you to death on the spot. I can almost imagine Paul shrugging his shoulders and saying, you know what? I'm not worried about it. That confidence that Paul had is the same confidence that you and I can have. We can be convinced about our future because we ultimately know how things are going to end. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen in a week or a year. I don't know how those test results are going to turn out or if the promotion's ever going to happen. But there is one thing that can never be taken away from you. And that is your life in Jesus. Because you have been given life in Jesus that lasts all the way into eternity. Life can be very unfair at times. We have to go through a lot of headaches. But you don't have to live life moment to moment and get all caught up in that. We can live in the future. We're convinced that God's promise to us is true. All things work together for the good of those who love him. You see, by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for us, our sins, our faults, our failures have all been forgiven. I will spend an eternity with the Lord in heaven. Being convinced about the future brings joy to our lives. Now that being said, we are also called to live in the present moment. In other words, we just don't sit around, twiddle our thumbs, and wait for heaven to show up. God didn't say, now listen, life's going to be horrible. Just suffer through it for 70, 80, or 90 years, and then heaven will be yours and everything will be great. I don't see that in the Bible. God has plans and he has a purpose for your life. Right now, whether you're 1, 10, or 100. And Paul used himself as an example. He says, well, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. He knew that God still had work for him to do. He wasn't done yet. He would answer that call and live in the present, even if it's in a dungeon cell. If you're still living, God has a higher calling, a plan, and a purpose for each of you. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. Because it knows, that means that you can know, that God is calling you to something to be accomplished, and that He's going to work through you to live your life to His purposes. 
knowing that you have a higher calling and that you're not just floating around aimlessly through life is something that gets you up and moving every single morning. When Apple computers started, Steve Jobs had this outlandish dream, at least for the time, that there would one day be a personal computer in every home. Now, he was a genius. He knew how to put those machines together. His problem was he had no clue about marketing, how to get them out in people's hands. He needed a high power hitter. So Steve Jobs set his eyes on John Scully, who at the time was the youngest uh, executive, the youngest president of the PepsiCo Corporation. Now Scully was in his early 40s when he took over <coughs> Pepsi. He introduced the Pepsi Generation campaign that those of you my age and older <laughs> probably remember. It helped them outsell Coca-Cola for the first time in their history. This was a big deal. So Jobs went after him. He whined him, he dined him, no avail. Scully would not leave Pepsi. Well, finally, completely exhausted, Jobs looked at him and said, so do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water, or do you want a chance to change the world? Scully left Pepsi. And I think we know how it turned out. Apple Computers has been very successful. Paul was saying to the church and the people there in ancient Philippi, do you want to wander aimlessly through life? Or do you want a chance to change the world? Now, at the time in Philippi, there was a lot of trouble for that young church. There were two groups that were attacking it from different directions, trying to drive divisions between people. Many outside of the church wanted that little church to just disappear. But Paul says to them, now whatever happens, in other words, whether he made it out of jail or not, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending for the faith. So why is that so important? He continues, this is a sign to them, the enemies of that church, that they will be destroyed, that you will be saved, and that this is all from God. In other words, do you want to change Philippi and the community around it? Stand firm in the faith. You'll prove your detractors wrong. Christ our Redeemer, do we want to wander through life or do we want to have a chance to change the world? God is calling us all to live in the present. There's a reason we're here, and better yet, God has given us an even higher calling. We can and have been making an impact on this community. That can bring us joy and a reason to rejoice, even in those times when it's tough, that we can answer and live out God's call in the present. Simply put, we can't let the past drag us down. Regrets, failures, past mistakes, each of those are tools of the devil himself. The Bible calls Satan the accuser because he wants to point out our brokenness, our failures, and our sinfulness. And he constantly brings up our regrets. It is the accuser who whispers in our ear, remember that thing you said you never do? You did it. That can zap the joy right out of our lives, bring you down, and make you feel absolutely <clears throat> useless. Forget the past, look to the future. And Paul, a bit later in his letter, comes back to the idea of being future-focused. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Now think of this. Paul had a lot to forget. <clears throat> he had been persecuting the church. He had been hunting down Christians, throwing them in jail, and having them convicted to death. Do you think for a single moment... The accuser didn't whisper that in his ear every single day. 
forget the past. Strain towards what is ahead. Jesus has given you a new future by releasing you from your past. God said, I will remember your sins no more. That is what faith is all about. That is why Jesus came into a broken world. The Son of God left heaven to release us from our past and to give us a new future. Now before Jesus, our future was certain all right. We were condemned in our sin. But now we have a future of life to the full. Jesus came. He lived among us. On that cross, he took our sin, our regret, our mistakes, and our failures. Because he gave his life for us, he made the payment that God demanded. And he's given each of us a bright new future. He released us from our past so we could look ahead to a new life and a new future. That's why Paul could give thanks to the Lord. And that's why you and I join him in giving thanks. Convinced of our future, knowing how it's ultimately going to end, we live in God's calling, not just in the present. We know there is a reason and purpose for our lives. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we forget our past as God has. Instead, we together as God's people, as a congregation, as a community, strain towards that future that brings us joy and a reason to rejoice, not just today, but all the way into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith of our Lord Jesus. Amen.